Hi, I'm Leila Belduga. I am a cartoonist and I am part of Helioscope Studio. And thank you, Ron Chan, for being here today. Well, let me introduce Ron Chan. Ron Chan just had a book come out last week called Earth Boy. It's written by Paul Tobin, but Ron did all of the art from the layouts to pencils to inks to colors and letters on this book. And I think you used Clip Studio for this, right, Ron? Correct, yeah. I have, I have pretty much 100% Clip Studio. Awesome, cool. Yeah, he's helped me so many times uh, in the physical studio space. And in fact, Ron just helped me solve a coloring issue this last week on a cover that I was coloring. So thank you for that. Um, Ron is also known for drawing plants versus zombies for years. Uh, you've done storyboards for various companies. You make amazing fan art very often and post it online so we can often see. And um, you also sometimes color for everyone at the studio, including me. Um, yeah, so you're just a pro at Clip Studio. Ron, uh, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Layla. Unfortunately, somehow between the, the 15 minutes between the last panel and switching my camera from one computer to the other, my, 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 my webcam stopped working. <laughs> so I'm going to be screen share only. You won't get to see my face, but I'll start the screen share and um, you can start talking about the program. Um, this is going to be pretty informal. I, I kind of, I've done this a little workshop for people a lot of times before, and it kind of just me talking about a lot of basic things about Clip Studio and what makes it different from drawing in Photoshop. Um, I'll do a little doodle. We'll walk through some of the features. If you're already an advanced user, you're probably not going to learn a whole lot because this is more meant to sort of um, introduce people to it who are more used to Photoshop. As Layla said, feel free to type questions into the chat. I won't be looking too much at it because it'll be hard for me to do while I'm um, on looking at my drawing screen, but she'll help relay questions to me. Um, yeah. I have a question already. We have a question from Abraham. And the question is, how complicated is it for a rookie digital artist to become competent enough at CSP to draw a newspaper style webcomic? Um, that's a big question. <laughs> how easy, it, it'll take some practice. I mean, if you haven't drawn digitally at all before, then there's going to be a lot to learn past just the program quirks. And it's going to be different for everybody, just kind of how fast you pick up software. Um, so that's going to be, that's going to change it. That, that, yeah, that question is hard to, to answer. I was, most of this, what I'm going to be talking about, it's going to assume you already have some experience with digital drawing. Um, probably in Photoshop, because I feel like most people start with Photoshop. But you know, whatever. We'll, we'll just start talking about features and stuff and how it's different and what, what you, the basics of what you need to know. I assume everybody can see the screen all right. Is this line, this line looks, you can see me drawing? I'm just making circles. I can see it. I can see it. Good. Yes. All right. So cool. let's start talking about the program. Um, one thing you should know uh, right off the bat is that the interface is highly customizable. You can drag and drop um, things in the interface wherever you want to put them. So if you're just starting off the program, yours is probably going to look a little bit different from mine because I've customized mine a bit. Um, so don't worry about um, exact placements of palettes and stuff because um, I've and yours probably looks a little different from mine. Um, I'm using the desktop version. Um, I hear the iPad version is basically the same, but I don't have an iPad myself, so I can't answer any iPad specific questions. But from what I hear, it's the full version of the program, it does everything the desktop version can do. So what makes Clip Studio unique and what makes it good? What makes it better than Photoshop, in my opinion, um, for drawing comics? Um, the first thing that I think anybody who picks up Clip Studio right off the bat is that the line quality just rules. It's great. Um, you just get really slick, sharp, lines in Clip Studio that I think are not possible in Photoshop, um, both due to the, the, some of the built-in smoothing and just the general brush engine. It doesn't have what I like to refer to as the Photoshop wobble. And anybody who's tried to do really slick line art in Photoshop, I think, I think you know what I mean by that. You, they, there's a certain like bumpiness and it's just, this is not as slick as this. And I think it's, as you know, you can see on my screen that the lines just look super slick, but also like 
anybody who's done a lot of digital drawing, like that's the first thing to notice when right when they start making lines in Clip Studio is um, there's an immediate tactile response in Clip Studio that just feels better than Photoshop. Um, Ron, uh, we have a question. Are you using a stylus? Yes, I'm using uh, I'm using a Cinti Companion Gen One, which is a, a screen tablet. Um, with a stylus. That is the way I've been drawing for a very long time. I did start off my digital drawing using like a, a non-screen Wacom Intuos tablet, which is just you know, a desktop version. Um, but I've I've switched to using all the you know Cintiq screen style tablet for a long time now. Moving forward, program features. What makes this, what, what do you need to know to get started drawing in Clip Studio right off the bat? Especially if you're used to Photoshop um, and what things might be different. Um, one of the main things that's different is this: the tool property menu is something you really need to be familiar with um, and keep track of. And that is basically the same as like in Photoshop. Towards the top of the screen up here, you have your info bar that keeps track of your brush size, opacity, blending mode, all that junk. In Clip Studio, it's a separate pullout palette it's called the tool property menu. And instead of being universal across your tools, like in Photoshop, where like no matter what brush you have loaded, it will maintain, for instance, your opacity settings. You know, if you have it set to 60%, it's going to stay at 60%. Or at least it was last time I used Photoshop. It's been years because Clip Studio is better. Um, whereas in Clip Studio, you have your tool property menu that keeps all of that. Uh, where I have docked right here right now, um, and that. Those settings are individual to each brush. You can see as I change which brush I'm using, um, so too are what is in the tool property because each brush maintains its own unique settings. And you can even see which settings are displayed are changing as I change brushes. Um, that's because if you hit this little wrench at the bottom of the menu, it brings up the full array of settings for each brush which can be adjusted individually, but only the ones with the little eyeball next to it are going to be displayed in the main sort of tool property shortened part of the menu, and the full array of them will be available elsewhere. Um, but if anything, you, know, you can you can put things on the, the short part, the main menu by, you know, clicking or not clicking the eyeball away. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you want a particular setting on a brush, but you don't see it. That's where it is. It's, it's, it might be hidden for that brush. Um, while we're talking about things in this tool property menu, we'll go ahead and go over some of these options. They have pretty much all the same stuff as like a Photoshop brush would. You know, you have your blending modes between, you know, multiply, screen, and all that business. Um, some of the things that are different is that in Photoshop, for instance, like your brush tool has more, you, you use brush tools and it gives you like a, a more, an anti-alias line. You can see that it's not pure black and white. There's some smoothing here with the grays in between. And um, Photoshop, that's a kind of their standard behavior for your brush tool, whereas your like, your pencil tool would be your hard edge tool that gives you that pure black and white line. Um, and that is not the case in Clip Studio. In Clip Studio, there aren't, there isn't a separate tool for it. There's every brush simply has an anti-alias setting where you can click how much anti-aliasing you want on that brush. Um, anybody who's a comic kind of book cladding um, knows that it's better to have a clean edge with no smoothing on it for your flats, because that means you can use your magic wand to select areas perfectly um, on your flats layer. So that's where it is in Clip Studio. It very, you can individually set it per brush just via this setting. Um, so just about, you know, any, any like hard edge brush can be a alias brush. Um, but if you take like, for instance, a brush that is already, um, textured in its texture tip and then you set it to no anti aliasing, it's not going to be hard edge because the nature of the brush is already soft. And then another big feature for Clip Studio is the stabilization. Um, you can see uh, here right now on my menu, stabilization. 
Um, and that is what will make your lines a little bit smoother. And you can, there's a, there's a little slider for it here, or a little clicker. Um, hey, Ron. Yes. Before you move on with the stabilization, I have a question uh, from the audience. Yes. Do you always work in raster rather than vector mode? I do usually work in raster mode, correct. Yeah. Um, Clip Studio does have vector layers, but I personally haven't used them much. But you can create um, a vector layer. Um, and when you create a new layer, instead of hitting the button that says just the plus, there's a little plus sign with a box on it, and that makes it into a vector layer instead of a normal layer. You can see, you know, here on my layer palette now, the layer one is a normal layer, and layer two is a vector layer now because it has that little box on it. Um, and there are some unique features you can do with a vector layer. For instance, um, the vector eraser is really cool. So now I'm on a vector layer. Any brush you use on a vector layer will record vector data, um, regardless of what brush it is. So it's, you know, this line, for instance, this arrow I've just drawn is on a vector layer. Um, but it's still, it doesn't look like vectory, you know, per se. Um, like you would think of like an illustrator thing. It still maintains the properties of that brush. Like I can still use my texture brush in that layer. And it's just recording vector data for the direction and pressure of the stroke. And then it's using it to, to make the line. Um, so it, it is and it isn't vector data. It, is, it isn't vector data like it's infinitely scalable like an illustrator thing. But it is vector data in that it's recording the math of your line stroke and it can do cool sort of vector specific things like, for instance, the vector eraser. Um, for instance, eraser for vector, you can do cool things like it knows exactly where lines are crossing and I can erase lines exactly at their intersections with the vector eraser like that. Cool. I had no idea that was a thing. Awesome. It is a thing. I actually don't use um, it much. But it is a thing, and it's pretty cool. Awesome. I have another question from the audience that I think you're probably going to get to later, but I want to say it just in case we forget. Um, does CSP have a color selection that selects even separate areas that have the same color like GIMP has? Or do you just click every area for flats? Are you going to get to flatting a little bit later? Yeah, I'll get to flatting. Cool. Um, okay. I don't know how GIMP works. Does CSP have a color selection that selects even separate areas have the same color. Oh, okay. You mean you basically you mean like um, it's, yeah. Whether you whether it can select only contiguous or or across the whole document. I think that's what you're asking. Um, so like for instance, if I have red here and I have red here and I have red here, whether or not the wand um will select just the one I click on, or if it will select um, every instance of that color. And the answer is yes. Um, in the, the magic wand tool, it, it they call it apply to connected pixels only. You can see it at the top of my tool property menu here. So that that is the same setting as in Photoshop. It would be called contiguous. I don't know what that's called in GIMP. Cool, that was it. That was exactly it. You got it. Cool. All right. I'll let you go on. No, no further questions at the yeah, moment. I'm going to keep rambling, but feel free to keep volleying questions at me okay. and I'll answer them as appropriate. Um, the next thing that's important to know about Clip Studio, I think, is the sub tool menu, which you can see uh, in my on my screen is here. I don't know where it is by default, but there it is on my screen. Um, and the sub tool menu is Similar to how, like in Photoshop, when you like shift, shift, click, I think maybe, or long hold on a tool in the menu bar, there are more tools under it. It's kind of like that, except for like that's where you store um, a bunch of your your settings for that tool. Um, so, for instance, I'm on the brush tool right now, and you can see in my sub tool menu, I have I have tabs for special brushes, paints, pencils. I have a project. I have a projects tab that I store brushes that I'm using for whatever projects I'm working on at the moment, ink, wash. So I have created buckets for each type of brush that I use, and those can be dragged and dropped in there 
at will. Like I said, it's a highly customizable interface and I have organized them myself by simply dragging and dropping them wherever I want them. Um, but, and it's important to know that, um, a lot of the tools in Cookie Studio are, um, hidden away in the sub tool palette. So you're going to want to keep your sub tool palette open. For instance, um, you know, like I click the ruler one and I have all the different types of rulers under it. I click the bucket tool and there's different types of paint buckets in it. I click my brush and there's a bunch of different other brushes. And I actually have multiple brushes in my tool palette. And, you know, right here is where all the brushes that I typically use are. But then like I have stored separately on my tool bar, like, you know, um, up here, here, I think I have stored at the very top here. These are the like, I think these are, yeah, these are the default CSP brushes. Um, I generally use custom brushes, but yeah, here's the default ones. Real G pen, textured pen. So you can, yeah, you can drag and drop stuff on the interface. Even on the toolbar itself, you can, you can create new entries. Um, which is what I have done to create my little toolbox here of tools that I like. I have a question from the audience. Um, yeah, go for it. Has, has anyone? experienced crashing problems on this program when your file becomes too big? Or I guess that's for you and the rest of the audience. Yeah. I have experienced very few crashing problems in Clip Studio as a result of a large file. Um, I won't say it's never happened, but I will say it's happened to me less than has happened to me in Photoshop. Um, I have, I've had the program chug on me a few times when I've tried to do something complicated on a large file. Um, but generally, I have been able to wait it out and the program will, after it thinks for a while, it, it has, it will figure it out and I won't, I'll, I'll be able to get past it. Um, I haven't had very many full crashes. Awesome. Cool. So uh, Abraham totally reminded us that you were talking about stabilization before I interrupted you. I bit. was talking about stabilization. Thank you. Um, stabilization. Um, stabilization is just a thing that Clip Studio has built into every brush that will um, do some some level of smoothing it for you. You know, with digital drawing, um, sometimes it can be difficult to keep lines smooth because you're working on a fairly slick surface. Um, and stabilization is just helps correct that. You know, right now I, the current brush I have is set to six. Six is a pretty low number. And it'll pretty much stick to whatever you put on your screen with a minor amount of smoothing. Um, if you, you can turn it all the way down to zero if you want none, or you can crank it up really high. And, you know, right now it has these like five little boxes I can click and at the max of the boxes is 15. But if you want to go higher than that, you can just use your keyboard and manually enter a number like, you know, I can crank it all the way up to 60. Uh, there's no reason to crank it all the way up to 60 unless you are specifically trying to make like a really long, smooth line. And that's one of the things that makes, that's one of the things that makes um, lines smoother in the studio. I typically keep mine relatively low um, for just general drawing purposes, you know, around six. If I'm doing something cartoonier that I want particularly slick lines, I might bump it up to 15. Um, I will say that um, it will on more complex brushes, if you have it up really high, it will tend to chug a bit. If you have it a complex brush with a lot of smoothing. Um, but generally, if it's, if the program runs pretty well. Right now, I'm just kind of getting, just doing some general drawing um, that we're going to use to test out some stuff. Um, uh, Ron, we have another question. Yeah, shoot. Can you personalize your shortcut keys? I noticed that both the pen and pencil tool look like the P key, or the pen key, I should say. Yes, um, yeah. Clip Studio is extremely customizable right down to the shortcut keys. You can just go to File, Shortcut Settings uh, on a Mac, it might be like, it might not be file. It might be like the Apple, whatever, whatever is left of that on a Mac. I don't even use Macs <laughs> where they keep their shortcut settings. And anyways, yeah, 
and you can set you can set your custom shortcuts to uh, anything you want. I've I've changed a lot of mine um, to to synchronize with Photoshop because I while I don't draw in Photoshop anymore, I do still use it occasionally um, for um, other stuff or processing things for going into CMYK mode for final print prep. That is one of the <laughs> downsides of Studio is that it does not natively work in a CMYK workspace. It only works in RGB, which for most situations is fine, um, but isn't great for uh, final print prep, which is for for like offset printing. Generally, you want um, CMYK mode. So I will still have to use Photoshop for that. Um, but I've adjusted most of my keyboard shortcuts to be the same between the two programs. So I, my hand doesn't get confused. Um, you know, so like, yeah, default, you, in Procedure, you use P for pen, but I'm too, I, you know, coming into it, I was too used to B for brush. So I changed B to be my main brush that I use. Um, I think I had to like change the lasso tool to L and I don't know, a few other things. I don't remember anymore. It's been so long since I last customize everything to my needs mm -hmm. um but for the most part like i would say like a good 85 percent of the shortcuts are the same you know i'm doing a free transform right now it's still it's still control t or command t on a mac um undo is still control z although um Clip studio has the behavior of control z being you know multiple undos as opposed to photoshop which does the sort of undo redo loop um mm. which i prefer you know the normal the multiple undos that clip studio has i've actually changed my photoshop behavior to match so my photoshop control z also does multiple undos um one major difference with clip studio shortcuts is that um you can set it, photoshop won't let you set the same shortcut to multiple tools but you can set the same shortcut to multiple tools in clip studio um, for instance, I have um, L set to both my freehand selection tool and my polygonal selection tool. So if you have the same shortcut set to multiple tools, pressing that button multiple times will scroll between those tools. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I press L once, I get my freehand. I press L again, I get my polygonal because I have it set to multiple tools. Awesome. Uh, Ron, someone asked, does Clip Studio have drawing assist like in Procreate to help draw straight and curved lines? Or is that basically stabilization that you're just talking about? You do have your stabilization, um, which is the main way that that happens. But you, you can also create um, guides that you could snap to, including uh, um, curve, curve guides, you know, figure guides. Um, I will go over some of that in a little bit as far as yeah, rulers that you can snap to and stuff. So yeah, I, I've, I don't have a lot of experience with Procreate personally, um, but from what I understand, I think it has also snapping rulers and guides and Clip Studio has very similar ones, though not the same. I, I think like Procreate might actually have more of them than Clip Studio, because I think they have like some more like um, curvy ones, whereas Clip Studios, most of them are more linear. Um, but there are cool things in it, like there are concentric circle guides, perspective guides, there are um, focus lines, stuff like that. I uh, just wanted to point out we have 15 minutes left. Oh, God, I had to speed up. <laughs> Okay, uh, I drew a little sketch of Spider-Man here. Um, let's ink this bad boy real fast. <laughs> um, one cool thing about Clip Studio, it has a layer property menu up here. There's a button that if I, can, if I just click it, it turns all of my lines to a color instantly. By default, it's blue, kind of to mirror the, the sort of blue line underdrawing that a lot of final book artists like to use. I'm going to click that, turn this underdrawing blue, lower the opacity, and then on a new layer, I'm going to ink him real fast and sloppy so we can get to uh we can get to some flatting spider-man is a character i like to draw for this demo because he has a combination of things on him in that he has a couple colors but not too many colors and he has a combination of 
big shapes and little shapes with his webbing. Um, while I ink this guy up real quick, feel free to ask me another question that I can talk about. Yeah, we have about uh, a little under 15 minutes now, audience. So if you have any last questions, this is the perfect time to ask it. I do want to point out, um, I am seeing a little bit of a lag with my view of this. Usually Clip Studio Paint, when you're working on it by yourself, it does not have that lag. So just to reassure anyone who might be worried about that. All right, webbing time. If you're ever drawing Spider-Man, remember that across his entire body, all the, all the webs radiate from the center of his face. Ooh, question. Did CSP ever get hue randomization for its brushes? I don't even know what that is. I think, yeah, in the latest update, it did it did implement um, some, some color dynamics into it. Uh, yeah, the latest update, they enabled importing of Photoshop brushes and with that also um, color dynamics. I haven't messed with it a lot myself because yeah, it's relatively new to the program. But yes, the answer is yes. Awesome, cool. And Mary who asked the question says, every stroke gives a new color. That is what the hue randomization is. Cool, thank you, I did not know that. Yeah, they, they added that recently. Um, yeah, if I look under here, and it's they have a whole menu called color jitter now with a bunch of um, settings that you can adjust. Nice. Uh, Abraham asks, did you create a new layer to draw through Spidey's eyes without showing the line? I, I used the magic wand to um, select out the parts that I wanted to draw so that I could, uh, yeah, so I can avoid his eyes when I was drawing the webbing. The magic wand and the paint bucket in Clip Studio, that's enough webs. We'll just, we're just going to deal with that. Um, <laughs> have a special feature that is real nice um, called there, there are two things that are special about it that make it really cool. There's closed gap and there's area scaling. Closed gap is based, what that basically means is you can set an exact tolerance for how large of a um, hole, you know, like that, that whether it considers it a closed line or not. Um, so if I go to my paint bucket tool, and I have closed gap, it's set to 12. So any any hole that is smaller than 12 pixels, it's going to consider closed. So then when I bucket it, it doesn't turn my whole document red. Um, that's one thing that's really cool about Clipsudio that Photoshop doesn't do is the, the sort of smart um, hole detector. So you don't have to close every line perfectly. The other cool thing it does is called area scaling. Area scaling is basically where it will overfill the area you fill. Like right now, if I have it set to zero and I paint bucket it in, you can see I get that white halo because of the imperfect edge. Um, if I turn my area scaling up to three pixels, it's going to take where it would normally fill and it's going to overshoot by three pixels. So if I turn down my ink layer, for example, you can see that it's now overlapping. Awesome. That's one thing that's really cool is you can naturally create that overlap in there. Um, so you don't get the halo even on an anti-alias line. Um, and so you can just take your paint bucket. Right now, I'm using a paint, a paint bucket called Refer Another Layer. That makes it so I can be bucketing colors in one layer while it's referencing colors in another. Right now, I am in layer three, whereas my inks are in layer two. But it's using the inks as the guide to color it in. Um, this is the flatting part that we had a question about earlier. Yeah. So. Now you can see, yeah, I'm, there are completely separate layers, but they're referencing, I'm referencing inks here. You can just click one area with the bucket and just drag your mouse over multiple areas and it will continue filling. And that's pretty cool. Um, when you do that, it'll only affect the color that you started on. So for instance, you know, now I'm doing blue. I started on a white area and it'll continue filling areas that are still white, but it, you'll notice it's not overriding colors that are already there. It's not going over the red. And that's one cool thing. Um, another totally rad thing is with another type of tool, a bucket called the enclose and fill tool. It has the same settings as all the other ones. It has the closed gap. It has the area scaling. But what it does 
is um, it, you can target uh, uh, an area. Right now, it's set to white and transparent. So anything that is viewable to me as white or transparent. So the layer itself is transparent, but my paper is white. So I have it set to that. Basically, what Enclose and Fill does is that if I draw, take, make a, like a lasso line selection around something, it will take every closed shape within that and it will fill it with my color. Awesome. Cool. We just got a question about that. So that is what the do you ever use lasso fill for this question was going to be. When it is a good time to answer it, uh, we had another question from Damien, which is, how did you learn to use this program? Uh, mostly trial and error. I watched very few tutorials or anything. I, I'm just kind of a natural tinkerer. So I, yeah, mostly I just, I just kept fucking around until I figured it out. <laughs> yeah, okay. That covers some of the, like the unique, all the tools, that, all the, the settings that it's covered for, for Bucket also refer to um, like the magic wand will also have the same gold scab and area scaling stuff. Um, while I have you here, real quick at, towards the end, I'll show some of the snapping stuff we were talking about earlier. Um, your people were asking about um, whether or not you have can create guides and snap stuff too. So here's like a curve ruler, for instance, I've created the circle and I can now create, you know, a line that snaps to that circle. And you can also create a perspective ruler. For instance, like if I can create perspective ruler, three point perspective. And I can use the object selector. It looks like this little box with an arrow on it. And I can adjust my, um, vanishing points. And once I have it reasonably, you can now all of your brushes will snap to those lines. So I can draw. It'll try to take its best guess for where every line should go in accordance to that grid. Um, so you can draw uh, boxes to your heart's content. Maybe mm -hmm. those boxes are buildings. Maybe you just draw warehouses a lot. This is probably my favorite tool in Clip Studio Paint is the perspective tool. It has helped me out so much. If you want to go quickly between drawing in perspective and not, you can click um, to you can turn the snap on and off. Um, I have a shortcut up here. You can see it on my screen right there. This on and off is the snap to grid button. So I can do it on screen or you can press command two or control two on a PC, turn that on and off. And that will allow you to go quickly between drawing um, freehand. If you want to make some trees on these buildings and snapped. Awesome. All right, Ron, you have about four minutes left. Four minutes left. <laughs> Yikes, that went fast. And one thing to note is that there is uh, I think a checkbox that says create at editing layer. I keep that unchecked. If you have it checked, then the perspective ruler will only apply to that layer. Whereas I want it to apply to any layer and you can just turn it on and off with the eyeball. Um, so I'm not drawing on the same layer as my perspective grid. Someone said perspective tool is worth the price all by itself. Absolutely. And talking about price wise, Manga Studio is probably the most affordable art program besides just getting Procreate automatically with any Apple product, I guess. Um, it's super affordable. I think it's super cheap. like, what is $99 for a year subscription or like $8.99. And those are like the, the that's like, for iPad. Ex experience one. Go ahead and dance. Sorry. I mean, Ron. I mean, that's for iPad. And then for desktop, it's, it's a single, single purchase price of $50, $50 flat. A lot of times it goes on sale for 25. Um, that's for the basic version of the program. The, they, they call it Clips Paint Pro. There's also Clips Paint EX, which is like, has a few extra features, um, but not that many. Um, that's like a hundred bucks maybe, but for the, for almost everybody who uses the program, I would say the, the cheaper version is fine. I have the pro, like the, the, 
normal, the cheap version on some of my computers, and I have the full version on some of my other computers. I go back and forth. I don't really use a lot of the features that are in the extra version, which are just the story mode, which organizes multiple pages in a single file. Um, and animation, there are extra, you can do longer animations on EX mode. Uh, Ron, one last question. Uh, sorry, we got a few in here. Oh, can Ron speak to any experience using templates like for pages? Like for I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I, I, uh, I, I know that when you make a new document, there are um, these comic templates. Uh, to be, I have not used a single one of them. I don't know how they work. I'm gonna be honest there. I'm I'm a I'm a real simp as far as my uh, knowledge of how to use those. I my I have like just my own template that's just like it's just like a raster document that has some guides on it that I kind of use to start my cover with pages. Well, cool. We are out of time. Thank you so much for being such a great engaging audience, everyone. That that's been amazing, Ron. Thank you. Uh, I love how every time I talk to you about Clip Studio Paint, uh, I learn something new, even though I use this program every week. So thank you so, so much for your wisdom. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for showing up. Sorry, I didn't get through more. It went very fast, faster than I expected. But I hope you, you learned a thing or two. A, a lot of people were like, holy crap, I didn't even occur to me. So yeah, great job, Ron. Thank you again, everyone. And we will see you at the next panel. Thank you, Ron. Bye.